permission to say this, by the way. Um, okay, so what we're going to talk about today is an added immunization review, and why, why do we need a review for that today? Um, and these are the people who know more about added calculations than I do, because a lot of people just have <laughs> four of them. Um, and so the reason we're talking about that today is because whenever we, we've actually asked family physicians what they thought about the adult vaccination program in British Columbia, and the answers were, is there an adult program? I think adult immunization program is extremely fragmented, yes it is. Um, they're pretty much exclusively relying on patients to present themselves and keep track of their own stuff as opposed to there being anything more structured. Yes, and that we're not going to solve that today. Uh, there should be more public uh, campaigns. Yes, there should. We're not very good at public campaigns, actually, in British Columbia or in general in Canada. Um, so one of the things we're hoping to do over the next little while is to change that and make them better. One of the things we do in Canada in public health is that all of our campaigns are sort of telling people what they should be. And um, I went to a recent conference where, um, where I realized that most European countries, for example, Switzerland, um, use humor. And it works a lot better. I did find it a little bit disturbing. If the Swiss are funnier than us, we're really in trouble. And, and the other is nobody has a record of their vaccinations. And true, nobody does. But, um, but how can you, uh, how can you meet, meet the needs of adults uh, with respect to their vaccinations in the context of that? So we're going to talk about the publicly funded vaccines for adults and why they are important. Some nasty recommended but not publicly funded vaccines. They're important to think about because in the public's mind, if it's important, it's funded. And that is no longer the case, and it will be less and less so the case as vaccines get more expensive. An MMR is $8 a dose. An HPV vaccine is $145 a dose. Funding for routinely recommended vaccines is going to be very different when the cost is an order magnitude different. And then some things to consider with adult immunization. So let's start with um, uh, the very obvious uh, vaccines. There's tetanus diphtheria. It's actually recommended for all, all adults with a booster every 10 years. Um, and uh, in much of Europe, it's actually a single adult booster that is recommended. Canada hasn't gone that way yet, so it's still every 10 years. What's really important is that sometime in their adult life, people should get a booster of tetanus diphtheria. Now, why is it important? Well, it's important because tetanus is ubiquitous. It hasn't gone anywhere. And in fact, although tetanus infections are rare, they do occur. There were three infections in the last three years, two deaths in the elderly. No significant injury in any of those cases. Um, they were gardening injuries. There's, I think, a child had a, a brick fall on her toe. Um, so it really wasn't, um, it wasn't the, I cut my, you know, I had a massive gash on my leg from an old plow, which is what most people imagine with tetanus. Um, and it is, it is a, it's a prolonged illness and a very um, undesirable way to die. So it is something that we forget about, but it is important that everybody get a TB booster once. The other is event, the other reason TB is important is because of events in other parts of the world. And, um, and we'll get a little bit later into the fact that immunity wanes for some diseases. So when I talk about other parts of the world, this is what happened with diphtheria in the 90s and the Soviet Federation when the public health system uh, broke down. Diphtheria was basically got eliminated through routine TB vaccinations, and then um, the public health system broke down, and an enormous outbreak of diphtheria occurred with thousands of deaths. And um, there are um, hundreds of thousands of people um, on an airplane every single day. And so international travel, as we'll, we'll get into a little bit later, does affect what happens to the population. The other one that's important is measles, mumps, and rubella. The reason that measles, mumps, rubella, is, it, it's not recommended that all adults born after 1970 have two doses of measles and mumps and at least one dose of rubella. The reason that the silly thing about the, this recommendation is that it's, there's a single vaccine, and the recommendations are different for everybody based on when they were born. Um, uh, what I mean is that the, diff the recommendations are different for each antigen. Well, you can't make that work. So effectively, if somebody was born between 1957 and 1970, they should have one dose. If they were born between 19 oh, after 1970, they should have two doses of vaccine. The reason that is important is because we recommend two doses of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine for everyone born after 1970, but only started giving two doses of measles, mumps, rubella in 1996, which means that there is a cohort of individuals 
for whom two doses of MMR are recommended but have only routinely had one as children. Uh, the reason that two doses are recommended, uh, the reason that is, is because the two dose recommendation didn't come into effect in, uh, until about the last five years for both measles and mumps. So again, why are these important? Again, it's international travel and cohort effects, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. With respect to international travel, measles is all, is basically was a one-time event in the first 10 years of my practice. In fact, it's considered a single dose of measles as a public health emergency. Well, what happened after the Olympics in Vancouver is that um, we had a whole lot more than a single case. In fact, we had about 80 cases of measles right after the Olympics in the Lower Mainland. And it occurred among both local individuals and among um, travelers. It was probably introduced twice during the Olympics. And, and one was probably by an Olympic-related traveler and the other one not because it was against the Olympics and it was a genotype that circulates in India. India didn't send a lot of winter Olympians to Vancouver. Um, but basically what happened is that measles started circulating among those who had only one dose of vaccine. We had some serious illnesses among people who were new Canadians and who received a measles, mumps, rubella vaccine at nine months in their home country and never again. And we actually had ICU admissions because of that uh, uh, outbreak of measles. So the two doses of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine is, are important for anyone born after 1970. One dose between 1970 and 1957. Those born before 1957 were likely exposed to both measles and circulating measles and mumps during, um, uh, during their lifetime. Uh, having said that, one of our measles cases was in a 63-year-old, so of course none of these are perfect. When is a good time? to um, get this vaccine. It's really important. Anybody who's coming to you, uh, a, a young person who's planning a family, it's a lot easier to give a second MMR when they're thinking about getting pregnant than when they're already pregnant and it's contraindicated. Um, and, um, and, and it also fits the demographic of those who are likely going to be needing it. With respect to mumps, this was a, the, the, uh, we also had a recent outbreak of mumps in the lower mainland, and that was due to what we talk about cohort effects. As I mentioned, those between 1970 and 19, <coughs> born between 1970 and 1995 have only had one dose of measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Now, mumps is a respiratory viral illness, and again, two doses are recommended. And over the last 10 years or so, we actually had a, a relatively um, uh, commonly occurring small outbreaks of mumps um, all over Canada. And then in 2011, a, a quite a large outbreak that started in Whistler among young adults. Originally, it was actually among young men. We were trying to figure out why it was among young men as opposed to young women. Um, and we think that it's because they share joints more often than young women in this work. But it was basically a perfect storm. There was a vulnerable cohort. There was a lot of international travel. A lot of people come from other parts of the world. Where, therefore, there was somewhere um, uh, there was an opportunity to introduce it. And young people share spit in multiple ways. In fact, creative multiple ways. We follow up all these cases. And if you can think of a way to share spit, they have thought of it. Uh, the only part of that we can realistically affect actually is the vulnerability of the cohort. The reason this is important for you is this is not a group of people that come to your practice very often. So if they're there, that's the opportunity. First of all, I don't have anything really interesting to tell you about except that, uh, that for adults, two doses of varicella vaccine are recommended due to um, reduced uh, circulation of varicella in the community. Uh, we are now going to soon get to um, a young adult cohort who will have not been exposed to varicella. The question is, did they get the varicella vaccine? So again, if you're doing blood work anyway, and somebody who does not have a history of varicella, it is worth checking that they are uh, immune to varicella. Fortunately, for chickenpox, history of chickenpox is highly reliable for determining whether somebody is um, somebody is immune. So you don't need to do serology on everyone, only on those who um, tell you that they don't know or don't think they have varicella. Hepatitis B is an important one, uh, especially for British Columbia. It's recommended for all adults born after January 1st, 1980. So anyone who is 32 years or younger should have routinely received a hepatitis B vaccine. It's three doses at zero, one, and six months of age. 
Uh, why is hepatitis B important? Because of, well, number one is because of the high prevalence of chronic hepatitis B carriers in our province. About 60,000 people are believed to have hepatitis B um, carrier status in BC. And because some parents, just, you probably have um, recent experience with the HPV vaccine, right? Lots of that, parents didn't want to get HPV vaccine to their children because their children were never, ever, ever going to have sex. And for well, a very, si a very similar attitude prevailed about hepatitis B vaccine when it first started. And there's actually quite a number of parents who chose not to give their children hepatitis B vaccine. Those, cho um, those children are now young adults and are sexually active. We've actually had a recent case of an acute hepatitis B in a young adult who, whose a mom was a conscientious objector. And just so that you know, 24 year old young men don't know that, don't care, don't remember. Um, and um, he was infected by a chronic carrier who was his first partner. So um, <coughs> fortunately he recovered, but basically um, it is important to ask any young adult whether or not their parents were uh, conscientious objectors and whether or not they had all their shots in school. One thing to know about adult vaccination is once eligible, always eligible. And that's because vaccination programs, again, are based on funding decisions by government. So they can't say, uh, starting today, um, everybody's going to be eligible for hepatitis B vaccine. They could, but if due to funding, that doesn't work. So Charlie vaccination programs start at a given age. So for example, hepatitis B started uh, with young adults in 1980. Um, and although free hepatitis B vaccine isn't available for every adult, for those who were eligible at that time, they will always be eligible. So anyone under 32 years of age is eligible for free hepatitis B vaccine in British Columbia. And um, the other reason that this is important is because universal hepatitis B vaccination has been actually extremely effective in British Columbia. Can we just say time? Probably. No. Anyway, <laughs> I just want to point at the graph. If you look at the number of acute cases of hepatitis B, in 1998 in British Columbia versus, versus in the last few years. So we basically got a handful of cases of new infections of hepatitis B in British Columbia, despite the fact that we have 60,000 people capable of infecting others. And those few cases tend to be a new sexual partner um, or so, uh, in, in an older adult. So something that we'll talk a little bit about is that an older adult who has a new partner has the same vulnerabilities as a younger adult. And, um, and uh, conscientious objectors or new Canadians are the individuals who tend to get infected today. Oh, I'm going to pass it. Um, and conjugate vaccine. Again, because of when the uh, program began, um, now anyone 24 years or younger is eligible for um, the meningococcal vaccine. Fortunately, um, uh, this, this was a vaccine that had a very, very high uptake, so people tend to not be missing this vaccine. It's still important to ask. The reason it's important is, despite its low incidence, meningococcal C infection has very high mortality, and vaccination works very, very well. This is the case fatality rate of invasive meningococcal disease based on serotype. And you'll see that the case fatality rate of meningococcal C infection is 22%. So one in five die, and a substantial number have significant sequelae such as loss of limbs, uh, deafness, or a neurological deficit. Fortunately, what happened is orange is the number of meningococcal C infections since the beginning of the vaccination program. We've effectively eliminated this disease from British Columbia right now. So um, uh, again, young people travel. It's so important to vaccinate them but it's an important vaccination for young adults because it works extremely well for, for a rare bacteria infection. So these are the routinely recommended vaccines for all adults. Now let's talk a little bit about what you would recommend for certain adults rather than all of them. Well, there's influenza. Now, I put this in the highest category and this is being filmed, so I'm still gonna say it. In British Columbia, it's not, I would say it's not the highest program, it's the highest program. Um, if you look at all the people who are eligible for influenza, I challenge you to find someone who isn't eligible for influenza vaccine. Certainly there are people who aren't officially eligible, but I wouldn't use your valuable time 
to deny an influenza vaccine to somebody who is presenting to you. They probably know someone with asthma, they probably will be in contact with someone under five or over 65, and um, so the chances are that somebody is really not eligible for any of the categories is not very high. Now, why is influenza vaccination important? Um, there's a couple of reasons. One is we have more deaths from influenza than any other vaccine preventable illness. People don't necessarily realize that because familiarity breeds contempt. We all say we have the flu, we all see the flu. But if you've got an infection that infects 30 to 40 percent of the population in any one year, even a very low mortality rate will give you a higher number of deaths than a rare infection such as pneumococcal disease. The influenza high is very high in the elderly and high rate of catastrophic disability in the elderly. So we, while we give influenza vaccination to elderly in long-term care facilities, which is very important, it's really important also remember that the healthy, independent, older person um, can, um, can become a significantly disabled person who never comes home from the hospital or from a long-term care facility after a virus of influenza. But the elderly suffer from immunosenescence. They basically don't respond to the vaccine very well, especially when the circulating viruses drift significantly from the vaccine virus. We respond to it very well, they don't. So they rely on the rest of us for protection. And again, our program is a high-risk program. I wouldn't advertise that everybody can have it. It's recommended for everybody. But I would say that, that, that we are probably hard-pressed to find somebody who doesn't fit into one of the eligible groups for influenza vaccine. Um, the other important vaccine for adults is the pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine. This is, there's a, this is for all adults age 65 years or older, and anyone um, 19 to 64 with many of the similar high-risk medical conditions that make you eligible for, um, for influenza vaccine. The ones that are important to remember because of their high prevalence are hepatitis B and hepatitis C make you eligible for the pneumococcal vaccine, as does the pulmonary and respiratory illnesses. We recommend only one dose of pneumococcal vaccine unless you're an, an individual with a specific set of high-risk um, illnesses, um, such as sickle death, cell disease, or, or ACE1, or if you're immune suppressed. Um, and that's because um, I think the, the, the studies showing that it's reasonable to boost everybody are not yet out. So at this moment, at this point, only one dose of vaccine is recommended for the majority of people. What we will likely go to rather than repeated boosters is expansion of the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that you're currently giving to children to high risk adults. Right now, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization is looking at that vaccine and its recommendation for high risk adults. It's not yet in place, but likely will be early next year. The reason that this vaccine is, is important to remember is that it's extremely poorly utilized. Less than 5% of people eligible for polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine actually get that vaccine. Given that it is the most common cause of community acquired pneumonia in those high risk individuals, that's, that's a problem for us. It actually was very um, sort of how to say, dramatically illustrated in 2006 in the downtown east side of Vancouver. How many of you remember this outbreak? So, this was an outbreak that occurred in the downtown east side. It was the largest community outbreak of invasive pneumococcal disease anywhere recorded in British, and it recorded anywhere in the world, and it didn't need to happen. Now, when I tell you that it was a big outbreak, it's 31, there was about 170 cases and 31% of them required um, ICU admission. There were more ICU admissions from this outbreak than there were from the pandemic. This was a significant impact, especially on St. Paul's Hospital. What was disappointing is that, that the, um, the outbreak was called by, caused by one of the uh, uncommon circulating serotypes called serotype 5, which was um, probably could cause the outbreak because it was um, not commonly circulating in the population, so people didn't have natural immunity from carrying. Um, but it was in the vaccine. And the majority, when I mean majority, I mean over 85% of people who got sick with this infection were eligible for the vaccine, not, and they did not have it. So um, I think it was important, and this is an outbreak that was entirely preventable, and in fact, oh, this is the thing that's on. And what we did was, um, 
Let's do that. <coughs> Terrible. Um, so this this was the peak of the outbreak. This is where we started vaccinating, and there was a dramatic decline in the outbreak. It was actually 6,000 doses of vaccine given in, on the street in the downtown of Cloud to people um, uh, getting sick at the time, and uh, and so the vaccine was highly effective. Um, because even though everybody was eligible, um, because of this outbreak, we actually uh, changed the recommendation. So anybody who's street entrenched or homeless or unstable housing um, is now also eligible. So they don't even need a medical condition. Anybody who uses crack cocaine is eligible for the vaccine because we have found crack cocaine to be a significant mode of transmission for infection. Now, hepatitis B, we'll get back to it a little bit because there's actually a good number of people who are not under 32 who are also eligible for hepatitis B vaccine. And it is important to remember, um, it's also recommended but not provided free for travelers and basically anybody at risk of acquiring hepatitis B. The reason it's important is um, although people at the beginning of sexual activity now would by and large be um, uh, protected against hepatitis B. Those who are starting their second relationships or ending marriages or not, and we are seeing um, sexually transmitted infections and blood-borne pathogens in that group, um, uh, even if you wouldn't consider them high risk by the usual, usual uh, criteria today. Hepatitis A, there's some um, special populations for whom hepatitis A is recommended, so anybody with hemophilia or chronic liver disease, so again, anybody with hepatitis B or C, tens of thousands of people in British Columbia should have their hepatitis A vaccine. Uh, anybody with HIV, anybody who's had a, a bone marrow transplant or a, a stem cell transplant, and all MSM, uh, or men who have sex with men and illicit drug users, um, and anybody who's a close contact with a hepatitis A case. One reason that, um, that um, I kind of wanted to bring this one up is we do have, on occasion, large exposures of hepatitis A. And if somebody comes to you and say, I've been told that I've, um, I'm, I, um, I, I'm a contact with hepatitis A and, and um, I need the vaccine, please give them the vaccine and then ask local public health because it's, uh, it's an important uh, opportunity. Um, and even if they don't have a letter or some, even if you didn't see the press release, um, it's important to provide that vaccine as soon as possible. Post-exposure prophylaxis for hepatitis A has a, a limited window area. Oh, actually, speaking of window periods, there was one thing I wanted to tell you about varicella, which you probably all know, but I wanted to remind you about that, is that we are getting outbreaks of varicella right now um, among those who have had one dose of vaccine. And um, I just wanted to remind everybody that the post-exposure prophylaxis is, is um, the vaccine is indicated for post-exposure prophylaxis. It's effective within three to five days. So if there is no contraindication for the varicella vaccine, and you're not sure if somebody is immune and they were exposed, you can get them the vaccine within three to five days. That is the same for measles, mumps, rubella. If anybody is exposed to measles, mumps, or, or, or measles in particular, the vaccine is effective within three to five days. It is not effective for mumps. Remember that. Want to tell you that? Pneumococcal conjugate, conjugate vaccine. That is um, now the vaccine that's recommended for people who are medically uh, at high risk. Um, so uh, again, ACE Lennox and uh, people with immune deficiency. So, so the conjugate vaccine has now replaced the polysaccharide vaccine. It's much more immunogenic. Um, it's uh, right now the, about when it first came out, we thought that it might be like the meningococcal C vaccine, that, that it, it had a very long efficacy. We now know that it needs to be boosted every five years. It's also recommended for travelers to the mening meningitis belt um, of Africa, um, and the um, uh, the uh, travelers to the Hajj. It's not provided free for travelers, unfortunately, but it is recommended. And here, because now we're getting some into some obscure things, um, such as um, Haemophilus influenza B. Again, it's, it, it is a vaccine that's available um, separately for those who are high risk. And then uh, the polio vaccine, again, for travelers, it is recommended that they get one dose, one adult dose of polio vaccine um, uh, uh, if they were traveling to an, uh, an endemic area. Another obscure one is rabies. 
Rabies vaccine is recommended for those um, who, um, who attend that college or animal health tech screening center. And um, it's a very expensive vaccine. So if you're ever, if you're ever worried about somebody um, needing this vaccine, it is $190 a dose. It's probably worth sending them to local public health to see whether or not they are eligible for $560 is a lot of money to pay for something that you may actually be eligible for. Now I'm gonna move on to vaccines. So these are the things that are, are, are provided for free and recommended and they're all in that handout. For, there, there are now other vaccines for purchase which may never become uh, publicly funded. Um, I, I, I sit at those tables um, and uh, where we decide uh, what vaccines, well, where we decide what to recommend to be publicly funded or all advocates who would like all of them to be funded. It is really important that the individual risk of your patient uh, is it necessarily correlated with uh, whether or not a vaccine is funded? It's made on popular, it's made on, a, on, on a, uh, the decisions whether or not to fund vaccine programs are made based on population level in, um, considerations, but also prioritization with respect to um, other public health programs. So vaccines for purchase uh, are just as strongly recommended as those that are, are funded. And in fact, the CMPA does require physicians to recommend these vaccines even when they are not, um, they're not funded publicly. So then one of the most important ones is HPV. It is recommended, but not provided free for females age 45 and males to age 26. So this is something that is a new, because I don't know how many of you are aware that it is now recommended for young men. Um, and Gardasil only for young men. It's three doses at that age, zero, two, and six months, or zero, one, and six months, depending on the product. Gardasil, as you know, protects you against four serotypes, two which protect you against genital warts, about 90% of genital warts, and two serotypes which protect you about 76% um, uh, of uh, cervical cancer. Cervix only protects you against cervical cancer. The eligible groups are, and the reason I'm, I'm stressing this is because like hepatitis B 20 years ago, uptake of this vaccine among eligible groups was very low. Um, about 40% when the, thanks to the McLean's article, about 40% in the first year. So Gardasil um, is all girls born in 1994 or later who are now 14 years old. And the reason we say 14 years or older is because um, the, uh, those that were 14 years and younger are gonna get it in school. So the, the quadrivalent, the four dose, is um, all girls. And Cervix, which is the two dose, there was a purchase made in British Columbia um, of a limited, for a limited time program for Cervix for girl, young women born between 1991 and 1993. It's a one-time program being, uh, it began in April 2012 using a limited quantity of vaccine. Now I'd like to know how many of you have heard of it. Oh, you have heard of it, great. That's fantastic. But many didn't, um, which takes us back to our ability to do that with campaigns. <laughs> so very good. So in January, there will be another public campaign trying to promote the vaccine. It, its uptake is only about 10% uh, so far. Um, however, when young women are offered the vaccine, even though it's a bivalent, not a quadrivalent vaccine, they're still very grateful that they can get anything because it is $145 a dose. Again, remember for these groups, not, not the one time, but for garden sale, once eligible, always eligible. There are going to be a fair number of young women coming to your practice over the next, I would say, five to 10 years whose parents chose not to give them the HPV vaccine. It will still be worth it to give it to them and you can give them the free vaccine. Uh, and the other thing, just uh, UBC, for example, the health plan covers up to two doses of vaccine. So, it's, so it, it really makes a difference for your patient if they're in uh, a, secondary, um, uh, a secondary institution to, um, or post-secondary institution, sorry, just to be told that, that they, it's not gonna cost them $450, it's only gonna cost them 150 because uh, many of these plans actually cover up to $150 worth of vaccine um, per year. Um, so this is the program that's about um, to come out. You'll be aware of it, which is great. Um, again, it's going to be Cervix. The reason it was Cervix is because Cervix is substantially cheaper than 
uh, Gardasil and that one-time purchase, well, with that one-time purchase, uh, we were able to protect a larger number of young women against cancer. Um, some of them may, um, may still choose to pay for Gardasil for protection against cancer wounds. Adicel is another one that we want to talk about today. Now, Adicel is not uh, routinely um, uh, funded in British Columbia. It is recommended by the National Advisory Committee for a once in an adult lifetime booster to get an Adicel, which is an acellular pertussis vaccine combined with the tetanus and diphtheria vaccine. British Columbia is one of the few provinces where it is not funded at this time, but um, it is important to remember that, that pertussis immunity wanes um, at, at five years after the last dose of acellular pertussis vaccine, and 75% of infants get pertussis from a close family member. Now, do you remember pertussis, colloquially known as the 100-day cough? Any, any one of us who had pertussis in our adolescence or adult life will remember, but, um, but it, is, uh, it causes a significant illness with a 1 to 2% mortality in un unimmunized infants, so in infants who are too young to be immunized. 75% of those infants get it from a mom or a dad or a grandma or a sibling. And, um, and it is a cyclical disease. There is always transmission of pertussis in the community. Though, when, though we've had relatively low level of transmission for about the last decade. But in the last, since last November, activity has increased quite substantially in the lower mainland, starting in the Fraser Valley and ending up now in Vancouver. We are well over 500 reported cases of whooping cough, and, and uh, reported cases of whooping cough can underestimate the actual number of cases by at least an order of magnitude. Estimates vary from five to 100 fold underestimation because most people don't get tested. Because of this outbreak for a limited time, right now Adacel is provided free for anyone who has not had a pertussis vaccine in the last five years who's in contact with young children in the lower mainland that was left intentionally vague. You can define young. Um, anyone who's a pregnant woman, it is important that Adacel is safe in pregnancy. It is a, it's an inactivated vaccine. And by giving it in pregnancy, you protect the baby in two ways. Um, the antibody does cross the placenta and therefore babies get passive immunity in the first four months of life, during which um, they are the most vulnerable and they don't have their um, active immunity from vaccination and it protects the mom from um, uh, uh, getting the process and giving it to their baby. A, a good number of women will be getting it in hospital right now, um, postpartum, if they didn't get it during pregnancy. You can absolutely reassure moms that it's safe in pregnancy, but if they still don't want to get a vaccine in pregnancy, postpartum is an important time to get it. Um, but the hospitals won't be vaccinating the dad and the grandma and the grandpa. Um, so it is an important thing to think about um, um, when babies, when parents come with their first baby visit. Um, and actually, it's also now provided free for all Aboriginal people because the outbreaks in our Aboriginal communities were uh, concentrated and quite significant. Um, and um, so those are the people who can get fee out of cell right now. So please order it from where you, in the Lower Mainland. Please order it. Uh, from your local community center and offer it to anyone eligible right now. This isn't going to necessarily be an ongoing program, so the opportunity may uh, pass us by. The pertussis activity has declined quite significantly since the, the peak of the outbreak, uh, but with school being back in session, we are seeing um, an, an, at least a modest upsurge we'll have, upsurge we'll have to see um, when uh, uh, whether or not it's going to uh, Peter Wright. The other thing that's really important to remember in the context of a pertussis, even though we're talking about adults, is that it makes it that much more important that babies get their uh, two, four, and six months vaccines on time. Uh, that means two months shots at two months, not two months and three weeks. And so it's a really important thing to talk about with moms even uh, uh, before the, the, the baby. Um, if it's hard to get the appointment, then there's that appointment when you expect the baby to be two months old. Um, and, and that's because um, even parents who want to do the right thing, we actually had a case in a very young infant who, um, 
whose dad, my grandpa, mom, dad, all came in to get their pertussis vaccine at the same time as the baby's two month shots. And unfortunately, by that time, the baby was in the So, um, so it is, it's uh, in the con good time um, <laughs> at the end. But, um, but uh, it is important that, that um, uh, with pertussis, there's significant transmission among adolescents and young adults and that they are the ones who are making, um, who are uh, putting infants at risk. The other thing to remember about this, again, just uh, deviating from adults for a moment, is that about half the cases of whooping cough in school-age children are, are coming from people who are unimmunized or partially immunized, um, missing one or two doses of vaccine. We are now getting the cohort of children in school who have only gotten the acellular vaccine the acellular whooping cough vaccine, and we are now learning that immunity from that will be at around five years. So we are going to have some vulnerable cohorts coming through and probably going to have to look at our program with more frequent boosters, uh, perhaps every 10 years. Uh, Zostavax is um, unfortunately not publicly funded. This is an excellent vaccine. And uh, my experience, are you able, are you offering this to your patients? And I mean, good, that's great. And are you finding like I am that people are really keen on getting this vaccine? And so it's interesting about acceptability of vaccines. One of the reasons uh, vaccination programs, or one of the biggest challenges for vaccination programs in general, is that the population no longer is seeing the diseases. They don't remember polio. Um, they don't even remember homophilus influenza and meningitis. So, um, What's different about this is that most people in their 60s know someone who is significantly affected by shingles. And so this is a vaccine that is, um, that, uh, is highly acceptable to patients and can, again, in terms of catastrophic disability in the elderly and important ones to remember on the 60th birthday. And I'm gonna just take a, a minute to talk about travel vaccines. Travel vaccines are not publicly funded in British Columbia, but they're extremely important. They are typhoid, we have vaccines for cholera, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, uh, menactra, in, uh, polio, and rabies. And adults and children, one of the reasons I, I want to take a moment to sort of think, uh, just stress this is, there's an enormous amount of travel, both for tourism, but also um, those who are visiting friends and family. And those adults will bring their children to the travel, back, uh, travel clinic and say, well, I was born there, I'm, I'm not gonna get sick. That's not true. Um, the, uh, one of our most common reasons for people coming back, or oh, having typhoid is having traveled back home to India. The, the children are fine, the children were vaccinated and they were not. Um, again, uh, a lot of people, especially in developing countries, will have had a single dose of measles vaccine at nine months and will be susceptible now, and therefore um, a measles most developed booster is indicated for them. So the thing to consider with travel medicine is, if they're going to Mexico, give them a happy vaccine and a Ducarol and you're fine. If they're going anywhere more complicated than that, do refer them to a travel clinic. And, um, and stress that it shouldn't just be for their eight year old. Um, they, they, they don't have immunity in malaria. They may have immunity to happy, but they don't have immunity to um, um, they don't have immunity to malaria, but they also don't have immunity necessarily to measles, to typhoid, or, or even to take off. And, um, and while the German people are very good at bringing their children, they're not always as good at, at coming as adults. Um, so this is summarizing the general considerations in the absence of a formal program. How, how, how can you incorporate adult vaccinations in a routine way into your practice? Well, I think an important one would be to, um, to include a part of every new patient uh, assessment. Uh, it's, a, it's a good time to remember that vaccinations are important for adults, and please don't assume that somebody else has thought of it, because chances are that they have not. Uh, the beginning of sexual activity in a new sexual partner, we're finding that young women who are going to options to sexual health have a really high uptake of, of the HPV vaccine. Um, and again, when they're planning a family, it's a good time to remember the pertussis vaccine. People are very, people are more than willing to pay the forty-five dollars for a pertussis vaccine, even when it's not generally recommended, which it is right now. And then again, it's time to travel. For new Canadians, um, 
you probably know this, but some people are surprised. There's absolutely no requirements to provide any vaccination methods upon, upon immigrating to Canada. So um, we do, uh, on the immigration medical examination, we do screening for uh, blood-borne pathogens, people get an HIV test, people get uh, a number of other uh, physical examinations, but they, there is no requirement for record of a, a vaccination. So if somebody came um, to Canada either uh, after school age, chances are no one checks whether or not they're vaccinated or they're up to date. Uh, most children who come during school age are caught up in, through the school system. Vaccine refusers, um, whom I don't call conscientious objectors because it makes, makes the whole thing sound a lot more honorable than it actually is. Um, it is now, um, uh, uh, I think the people whose parents started in higher numbers to uh, decline certain vaccinations are now reaching young adulthood. And it is a good time to ask them. Simply ask, did you get all your shots at school? Did your mom um, have any objections to vaccines? They, um, and, and remember again, once eligible, always eligible. They may make different decisions about vaccinations than their parents did. Often they do. And then susceptible cohorts, for example, uh, 1970 to 1995 with MMR and any adults right now who need to now, the assessing immunization history in the absence of records, which is most of the time, uh, just uh, be cautious. Whatever they tell you, unless you have an actual record, is a best guess, and it's perceived as a record of truth. We all think of it as a record of truth, but in fact, it truly is a best guess. Uh, it can give uh, you, uh, the patient a false sense of security, and don't assume that they got what they would have gotten if they hadn't. Uh, they were born in BC. British Columbia has one of the best uh, funded vaccination program in the world. We are um, we started adolescent uh, whooping cough programs. We started uh, neonatal hepatitis B programs. A lot earlier than anybody else. One of the things is there's absolutely no harm in repeating the dose of the history is unknown. So um, uh, there's revaccinating is never a problem. The only thing that can happen is if they've had a pneumococcal vaccine or a tetanus shot relatively recently, they will get a sore eye. Uh, now there are some people who are more complex and there are some really good tools for planning immunization. The BC CDC website, the immunization manual is actually an excellent resource for you. Um, I included the, the quick reference, which is the Vancouver Coastal Health Adult Immunization Schedule for Unimmunized Adults. Um, and, uh, and of course your local public health. We're, we're very happy if you've got somebody who you really don't have time to assess their immunization history. And half of it is in Arabic, and, um, and you just want to do the right thing. There's two things you can do. You can start all over, but generally for school-age children, that's not a very attractive process to give them a whole um, uh, vaccination schedule, because that's a lot of folks. Um, just um, contact the local public health office, and they'll um, uh, they'll review the immunization and we'll give you basically a schedule to follow for the rest of the immunization for that individual. There are also some really good translation tools or international resources if you want, if you wonder what people got. There's BC HealthLink files about vaccinations that can be very helpful. They're available in the common languages, Chinese, French, Punjabi, Spanish, Vietnamese. Um, and there's an immunization clinic uh, screening form as well. And then the other thing just to finish with um, is immunocompromised patients. Um, there, there are a lot of people with immunocompromising conditions and, and medications, and vaccination by and large is actually recommended and safe for them. Live virus vaccines, which are measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, zoster vaccine, yellow fever, are the only ones with which you have to be cautious. But even with the inactivated vaccines, the, the, the biggest question is, how do I maximize the benefit um, uh, versus uh, the harm? In other words, you want to vaccinate people when they are able to respond to a vaccine. So you might want to, for example, if somebody's HIV positive, you want to be vaccinating them when they um, have an immune reconstitution so they're able to respond. Um, make no um, assumptions about susceptibility or protection for anybody with a bone marrow transplant or immune suppression. Those are the individuals for whom serology is recommended. You can, uh, there are good immune correlates for measles, for mumps, for rubella, for varicella. 
Uh, consider the vaccine environment broadly. For people who are very young, very old, or immunocompromised, uh, vaccinating their, um, their families uh, and friends and partners may be your best, um, best way of protecting them. Again, avoid live vaccines without a consult. Um, administer routine boosters and um, do consider the use of passive immunity agents. So if somebody's immunocompromised and known to be exposed to measles or varicella, um, immunoglobulin is uh, available to you to protect them. And these are probably your best, best websites for adult immunizations. Um, and hopefully you'll find uh, the handout useful. And that is my blurb for today. And thank you very much for your attention. But um, again, uh, the risk of pertussis right now is, is, is quite significant. So I wouldn't consider that a complicated thing. Yeah? Can I do three quick ones? Uh, oh, yeah. how, how effective really is the zoster immunization? That's one. Uh, for those born before 1957, how many things are we supposed to be immunized against naturally? And is that really true? Mm -hmm. And the third one is I work in emergency and I dealt with a lot of those downtown insiders very closely intubating and should I get pneumococcal immunization as well? Excellent question. So I'm going to start with the last one and the yeah. answer is no. Um, so the, the transmission, invasive pneumococcal disease is transmitted through the droplet route uh, for which um, routine infection control precautions are extremely effective. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, no, it, we did not have healthcare workers getting ill at all. Um, and, and it really actually, the, the only people who we worried about were um, actually service providers in the downtown inside. So people who live, who work in the shelters, who have prolonged um, exposure to those individuals. But no, we don't, there is no occupational indication for the pneumococcal vaccine. Uh, the zoster vaccine is about 60, the earlier you give it, the more effective it is. So the closer you to 60 you give it, the more effective it is. It's about 60% effective, but it's much higher than that against both hepatic neuralgia, which is, a, which is really the significant outcome we're worried about. Um, the, the acute pain can be significant, but it is manageable, but post hepatic neuralgia is, is, is the, the, the actual outcome we're trying to prevent. And people who were born before 1957, were likely immune to H1N1, but that is not enough. <laughs> Uh, they, they were very likely exposed to measles, mumps, and rubella, and chickenpox. Those are the things uh, that they would be exposed to. Older people who are much older, so people in their sort of 75, 80, they were probably also exposed to hepatitis A. The reason that's important is actually we tend to get a fair number of hepatitis A IgM, which in indicates hepatitis A, in older adults if someone tests for it. So one thing about hepatitis A in that population is only test for hepatitis A if you actually think they have hepatitis A because we get a fair number of false positives because individuals have been exposed. Those are probably the infections most people have been exposed to that are vaccine preventable in that age group. Okay, one lady there and there. Depends. The answer is that depends. Um, right now, for example, the, the only thing that might come up is for, for a healthcare worker, uh, for, for a healthcare student. If somebody's got serological protection for measles, that's a good correlate of protection. For months, it's not considered a very good correlate of protection. 
So it's, it's not necessarily um, helpful for you to do that. For, I would say that for, health, for young adults, so that, that's the age group, um, to make life simple, just give them another NMR. Because if they're going to ever work in healthcare setting, if they're ever going to be going to college in the United States, the, the sort of the gold standard for evidence of immunity is going to be two doses of lupus, not for no So the effectiveness of Rostovax after shingles hasn't been assessed. It's not thought to be harmful, but the effect, uh, basic, uh, whether or not it actually will prevent a recurrent case of zoster of, um, of is not known. It's not, again, it's not harmful. Um, I would wait for the person to recover, um, but, um, but whether or not it actually does any, has any benefit is not known. Again, it's not contraindicated because it's, um, um, it's not gonna do any harm, but, that wouldn't be a primary indication. Hopefully, we'll get it before they get to it. Arizona, um, one small point I'm trying to understand the logic. It says that the adults with no history after one year of age can negative their cell IgG. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be IgM? No, IgM is, uh, IgM tells you whether or not you're acutely infected with something. So, IgM for most infections goes up very quickly and then declines. The IgG is the, okay. So unless a person is, has no spleen or has, for certain medical conditions such as sickle cell anemia, anemia, ACE planets, or HIV, there is recommended one booster dose at five years. For everybody else, it's recommended just one dose at 65 is what's recommended right now. But it is a very valid question because people are living longer, and there's we, we don't actually think the vaccine is necessarily going to protect you um, for the next 30 years. But um, uh, because it's a polysaccharide vaccine, where repeated doses can actually lead to a, a, a blunt immune response, what we're looking at is a different kind of vaccine, the conjugate vaccine, and that will likely uh, become recommended to older adults over the next few years. It's not yet. Um, so hepatitis A and hepatitis B are both exceedingly uh, immunogenic vaccines. So um, the circoversion rate for um, hepatitis B and hepatitis A both are over 95%. Uh, you should not be regularly testing people for circoversion to hepatitis um, A or B. Um, it's, public, it, it's not indicated. Uh, for hepatitis B, the only people I would do um, uh, serology for are individuals who are likely to be at ongoing risk. So it would be a, a babies after the uh, babies born to hepatitis B infected moms, um, people who have a hepatitis B infected partner, or um, or and also people who are immunocompromised. And um, and the serology should be done at one to six months after um, after the vaccine series is completed. If you do a serology after that, you will likely will have a decline in antibodies, but it does not mean that the person is not immune. And so, it's, so if you have a serology above 10, you know the person is immune. If you have serology below 10 and they're within six months of the last dose of hepatitis B vaccine, because they did not respond, you need to repeat. Um, but if you've measured it after that and it's below 10, you won't necessarily be able to tell the difference between uh, then having had declined anti uh, declining antibodies but sufficient cellular immunity to be protected um, and, uh, and or whether or not they're not immune. If you absolutely need to know, you could always check. If they're below, you can give them one booster and check again a month later. The only person for whom ongoing uh, testing is required is people who are HIV positive and that's because unlike for the rest of us, um, Having had serology about 10 once, we, it, we assume you have lifelong immunity. For those who um, are uh, HIV positive, we now know that they need to maintain their level above 10 for ongoing testing. Is that? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
I, I suspect low dose methotrexate wouldn't be a contraindication, but I, for all of those, I look up the tank at every time. <laughs> Just in case I forget. I mean, I haven't said that. Um, I, I used to work at a refugee clinic and used to give NMRs regularly, and then and then did this HIV test. And it's not a very nice feeling to find out that you've just given a measles mumps to Bella vaccine to somebody with a CD4 count of eight. I can tell you that from personal experience, it worked out fine. <laughs> but, um, so I'm not sure exactly what I would look that up. So, the, so the, I believe that vaccine is recommended for people who um, who have renal disease, HIV. HIV. Um, basically, you used to double dose those individuals, so that would be that would be their second. So, normally, what's recommended, I believe, is that you repeat the dose, and if they still don't uh, they still don't seroconvert, then you do the higher dose. It does it does increase the rate of seroconversion, but there's still going to be people who are not going to convert. No, right now it's in the lower mainland um, and, and Aboriginal people anywhere in the province. Uh, we're looking at an out of booster uh, program um, and putting it sort of in the priority of next phase to um, offer, uh, but it is a limited time uh, program even in the lower mainland. So once we declare the outbreak over, it will be gone. So use the Well, thank you so much for, I think, a pretty amazing roster.